the aim is to prove this Potapov Sukhachev theorem here, which is on the screen. If you have compact self adjoint operators, then you can define functions f of u and f of v through functional calculus or spectral theorem or however you want to think of it. And you have this Lipschitz continuity property of that functional calculus, continuity in the underlying operators as you have a fixed Lipschitz function. And we wanted to somehow reduce that down to the UMD property of the Chapman classes. So let's do that. What do I need to recall? I do need to recall the definition of sure multipliers. If H is a Hilbert space and E lambda is a countable spectral resolution. Countable spectral resolution, meaning it's a countable sequence of pairwise orthogonal projections in the Hilbert space. You've got some countable indexing set contained in the real line. And if you have an infinite matrix M indexed by that indexing set, and you take a bounded operator U on H, then the sure multiplier of U with respect to all this stuff, so symbol M with respect to the countable resolution E is given like this. E lambda U, U, E, U. This is the Schur multiplier with symbol M. And this sum is generally not well defined. I was saying on Tuesday that if, if U is finite rank, then this sum is finite. That's not actually true. Um, if U is finite rank, then it's going, this is going to be finite in lambda, but not necessarily in mu. Basically, the target of U's got finite dimensional range. So you've only got finitely many lambdas here that come after U that will not vanish, but you could have infinitely many E mu's here that don't vanish. So even when U is a finite rank operator, this sum's not finite. But at least you can show that if U is finite rank, this makes sense. I won't prove it. Makes sense if U is finite rank. And let's call that an exercise. Although that's not an exercise in the notes. The way to make sense of this, I should just say, is you, you take finite sets contained in Lambda and you let Lambda be a union of finite subsets and then you work with the finite sets throughout. I'm not going to be very careful about that in this lecture. I'm just going to say, let's just assume it's well-defined. Let's just work formally with these sums. Let's pretend only finitely many terms appear and everything will be okay. So our main theorem for the first half of the lecture is a sure multiplier theorem. So remember on Tuesday, we proved that diagonal sure multipliers that are bounded down the diagonal give bounded operators on every Shatton class, just using this operator ideal property of the Shatton class. But of course, we're going to need non-diagonal form sure multipliers for anything to be interesting. And this is where the UMD property comes in, interestingly enough. So here's our assumptions. Let M, rather than being an infinite matrix, let's take M to be a continuous function on the real line, not defined at the origin. You don't need to have any continuity there. It doesn't need to be defined. Complex valued function, which is continuous. And let's assume that this is a, okay, I'm saying scalar value, but we don't need to say that, a Michelin symbol. So remember, we have our Fourier multiplier theorems and certain symbols of Fourier multipliers are called Michelin symbols. They're bounded. They have some nice differentiability properties. We can assume M is a Michelin symbol. And through that Michelin symbol, we're going to define an infinite matrix, M lambda mu. And this is going to be M of lambda minus mu, if lambda and mu are different. And of course, we're thinking of lambda and mu coming from a spectral resolution. So these are real numbers, so we can take the difference. And on the diagonal, let's just take a constant C. For some constant in the complex numbers. 
So we have a, an infinite matrix on the diagonal, it's a constant, and on the off diagonal, it's given by the differences of a Michelin symbol. So it's a quite particular form of infinite matrix, definitely not an arbitrary one. It's, it's constant down every diagonal, if you think of the generalized diagonals of matrices. So given this form for every operator V, don't know why I'm calling them V instead of U, for every V, actually, I'm gonna assume that V is in a Shannon class and that P is between one and infinity. You will have boundedness of the associated sure multiplier on the Shannon class with a constant, which is of course the Michelin norm of the symbol plus the constant C that is given by the, the diagonal terms. And you have the Shatton norm of V. Basically, if you have a sure multiplier whose symbol is given by a Michelin symbol in this funny way, you can actually use the Michelin theorem to deduce boundedness of it. So we're going to somehow reduce boundedness of sure multipliers to boundedness of Fourier multipliers. And in fact, in this theorem, we don't actually need M to be Michelin symbol. We need M to be a symbol such that the associated Fourier multiplier is bounded on LP. It's actually going to be L2, strangely enough. But we'll see in the proof that it doesn't actually matter that M is a Michelin symbol, just that you have boundedness of a Fourier multiplier. Being a Michelin symbol will be enough for that. And of course, on the diagonal here, you don't have to have a constant. You can have a bounded function. It's all going to be OK. In fact, in the first step of the proof, We'll use exactly that without loss of generality. We're going to assume that C is zero because the contribution on the diagonal, this is going to be a, a diagonal form sure multiplier. And we already showed on Tuesday that these are always bounded. As long as the diagonal coefficients are, are bounded, this diagonal part is a bounded operator. We can subtract it off. And what you're left with is something of this form but where C is zero. So without loss of generality, just in the beginning, assume C is zero. Let me just note diagonal sure multipliers are bounded on Shatton classes. So there's no contribution from the diagonal anymore. We just ignore the diagonal. Does that make sense? It's all okay, good. It just occurred to me I don't have chat open. There's been nothing in the chat, but just in case there's any questions in chat, I should have that open. Okay. Right, so we assume that there's no diagonal contributions in this operator. That'll make things easier. And what we're going to do is a really great transference trick, which is going to take this sure multiplier and we're going to start to see it as in terms of operators on the on the torus. Are we going to torus? No, on the real line, not the torus, sorry. There's no real line involved here at all, other than, okay, there's a real line here. And there's a Michelin symbol, the real line appears there. But in terms of the statement of the theorem, nothing about the real line whatsoever. We're gonna introduce the real line back in. For all T in the real line, let's define an operator U sub T, which will be the sum over the indexing set for the spectral resolution. I probably should have said in the theorem, let E lambda be a spectral resolution on the Hilbert space H. You all assumed that anyway. So U sub T is given as the sum over the spectral resolution of E to the two pi I lambda T E sub lambda. So we have some complex exponential factors, some phases uh, being applied to our spectral resolution here. These operators are unitary. Their inverse is their adjoint. Adjoint of U sub T, just computing it component wise here is U sub minus T because that adjoint just becomes a conjugate one of these complex exponential factors. And of course you have U T, U minus T is the identity operator. Just using the orthogonality, the pairwise orthogonality of this, of all these projections, you just end up multi multiplying out their coefficients. 
So we have some unitary operators. So therefore, for all t, if you take the norm of the Schur multiplier that we're considering, and you notice that conjugating an operator by a unitary operator doesn't change its Schatten norms. It doesn't change any of the approximation numbers. Everything's isomorphic, and therefore it doesn't change the Schatten norm. So this norm is u sub t times the Schur multiplier times u sub minus t. You have that. Let me just write as a note. Conjugation by a unitary preserves approximation numbers. And the Schatten norm is given as the little LP norm of the approximation numbers. So if you preserve all the approximation numbers, you preserve the Schatten norm. Right, so for every T, you have this identity here. And this turns out to be extremely useful. Let's compute this operator here. We just have to write everything out. So let's write out the Schur multiplier. And we're assuming that the diagonal contribution is zero. So we can assume that lambda is not equal to mu. Then let's write what u sub t is. Lambda one in the set, two pi i lambda one t e sub lambda one. Then we have our sure multiplier and the symbols given as the difference of this symbol m. I need a bit more space. E sub lambda v e sub mu. And then we have the u sub minus t. We get a complicated sum. And you can simplify that, of course. And you can use the orthogonality of the projections. Like you'll have an E sub lambda 1 against an E sub lambda. So lambda 1 is lambda. E sub mu against E sub lambda 2. So lambda 2 is mu. You know, then you put all that together. And you get a complex exponential factor with frequency lambda 1 minus lambda 2. Wait. Lambda minus mu, sorry. Same thing. Wrote it down right in my notes. <coughs> we have a T before I forget that. M of lambda minus mu, E sub lambda V, E sub mu. Actually, there's no full stop there. I have another little simplification of this. And you see that what's happening is that all of these difference terms are appearing. So actually what's starting to matter is the set of differences in this indexing set of the spectral resolution. So we can actually index it by those. Theta in delta, where delta is the set of non-zero differences, lambda minus mu in this indexing set. These differences give you the frequency of these complex exponential factors. Then you have m of theta and let's write the remainder as v sub theta, where v sub theta is the sum over all lambda and mu such that the difference is theta. e sub lambda v e sub mu. So you can check that this identity holds. So incidentally, this also shows uh, an estimate we're going to use later. If you sum over all of these differences, e to the 2 pi i theta t, v sub theta. So if you let m just be constantly equal to 1, and you take the norm of that, that will actually give you v minus v sub 0, because you're looking at all of the non-zero differences that appear. So you've got a this v0 is where the, the zero differences would occur. The lambda equals mu terms, but yeah, I'm just confusing myself, sorry. But this is bounded by two times the norm of V because V sub zero actually turns out to be a sure multiplier of a diagonal form. The symbol here is M lambda lambda equals one.
and you know that these things have a, a nice bound in the Shatton knobs. Is that all okay? I went through that a little bit quickly. Good. Okay, how do we actually use this, this identity here? How do we reduce this down to Fourier multipliers? You can already see from this form here, this is already starting to look a little bit like a Fourier multiplier. You have M of the frequency times a complex exponential of that frequency. So it's starting to look like Fourier multipliers are coming in. What we have to do is fix a function phi in L2. Doesn't matter what it is, as long as its norm is one. Completely arbitrary. And we fix a, a dilation parameter S greater than zero, which doesn't really matter. And we can compute like this. The norm that we want to control, I think we're squaring it. Yeah. We write this as an L2 norm. So we take the norm that we want to estimate squared, and then we take a dilation, L2 normalized dilation of S oh, by S of phi dt. Let's write it like that. There's no t dependence here. We're taking the norm we want to estimate, we're multiplying it by one. But we're writing one as the L2 norm of a dilation of phi. But then what you do is you put in this u sub t and this u sub minus t on the left and right of the operator, which you know doesn't change this norm, and but it makes it t dependent. This is an interesting argument because usually you want to get rid of things like t-dependence in an integral. Here we want to put it in. <laughs> so here we're introducing this t-dependence completely artificially. And we can rewrite this as this sum over differences theta, m theta e to the two pi i theta t. And let's put in this dilation here, although it doesn't do anything v theta, Shatton norm dt. So that we have something that looks a lot like a Fourier multiplier. It's not a Fourier multiplier, but it looks a lot like one. And we put this dilation inside here just so that it looks like a Fourier multiplier applied to this function, although it's not one. So since this looks like a Fourier multiplier, what we're gonna do is say, let's just pretend it is a Fourier multiplier and subtract off the error terms. And let's hope we can bound the error terms. So we use triangle inequality. So this is less than or equal to, actually, maybe I shouldn't have put the squares if I want this to work out. Let's be a bit more careful, write it like this so that the triangle inequality works. So we'll have the Fourier multiplier with symbol M. Let's just put that in there. This is what we want to be there. Let's put it there. Applied to the complex exponential E sub theta. Yeah, the, my notation's a bit bad. This is a, let's write it as X sub theta. I don't want to confuse it with the, the spectral projections, whatever this is. Complex exponential frequency theta times, and I've lost track of my notes, okay dilation of phi and we'll tensor that with the vector or the operator v sub theta that's a function of t we take its shatton norm dt so we're doing the classic argument of saying this is less than or equal to what we'd like to be there plus the error term so we need the error term the error term is m of theta minus that Fourier multiplier applied to all this stuff. One half. Everyone agrees with this? Just so that we, does anybody not agree with this? No? Good. This is the Fourier multiplier. with symbol M. Because of course, our, our symbol of our sure multiplier came from an actual symbol of a Fourier multiplier. It had this special form, so this we can do this. We couldn't do this argument for a, a sure multiplier with a general form. 
So we have two terms now that we need to bound one and two. Bounding one, we're actually looking at the norm of a, of a Fourier multiplier here, because I can take this T sub M and put it out the front of this sum because M, this operator doesn't depend on theta by linearity, we can take it out of the sum. We should always pretend this sum is finite so that all of these steps are justified. The sum isn't actually finite, but from what I said at the start of the lecture, if you're looking at finite rank operators, you can start to pretend this sum is finite. It's, it's still not, but one should be more careful with this. I won't be careful here. So you see, this is actually an L2 norm of a Fourier multiplier applied to some function. So this is an L2 of R valued in CPH. And because this Chatton class is a UMD space, we're looking at the norm of a, of a Micklin multiplier on L2, and these are bounded since the Chatton class is a UMD. So you use the UMD valued Micklin theorem. You take out the norm of this Fourier multiplier, which you know is controlled by the UMD constant of the space, which we know just depends on P, times the Michelin norm of the symbol. Let me write this out. Right. Exp theta. Dilation. Like this. Okay, that's what we get by using the Michelin theorem. This is the only place we're going to use the UMD property in this whole argument, so pay attention to it. That was a very important step. As I said, this is an unnatural application of Barnack valued analysis. We reduced it down to some analytic property of Barnack valued functions, and we successfully used the UMD property to bound something. That's a big deal. We still have more argument to do, but that's the only place where UMD appears. Okay, chat and classes UMD. That's the most important thing. All right. Let's go back to this. We still have to bound the term on the right. So we have a Michelin norm of M. We have Okay, what am I doing here? So we're gonna write this. This is just a function that doesn't depend on theta at all. All of the T dependence is actually in this function. So what we can do is we can take out this operator. Let me write it as a function of t, e to the t pi i theta t, v sub theta. Okay, there is t dependence there, but it doesn't matter. Wait, does this matter? Let me write it out properly. t pi i theta t times some function times this vector that doesn't depend on t. And yes, okay. Let me write it out in this way. This is a scalar and this is a vector. So now we just take out the norm of that scalar. I'm going to do that in the same line just to save some space. Okay. That's what we needed to do. So we had before, we showed that this was actually less than or equal to two times the norm of V for every T reducing it down to boundedness of a diagonal sure multiplier, that step that I did very quickly. So all of this is less than or equal to the, the Michelin norm of M times the Schatten norm of V times the L2 norm of this L2 normalized dilation of phi. But this is equal to one, but we could ignore that. So the first term has the, the bound that we want. I think I didn't explain that very well. Did that make sense? Okay. 
basically the first term is really just the UMD valued Micklin theorem. And then you just quickly get everything back in the right form. It removes all of the dependence on the symbol M and reduces it down to the identity. So we need to look at the second term now, this error term up here. So let's just write that out. So point-wise multiplication by M minus the Fourier multiplication by M. Get our dilation. Notice actually in that last step, the parameter S wasn't important at all. We didn't care what S was. In the second, in the error term, we're gonna send S out to infinity to make the second term vanish. So, all right, here's our error term. We're going to pretend this sum is finite. As I said twice already, the sum is not actually finite, but you can reduce down to the finite case for finite rank operators. So we'll just pretend the sum is finite. Okay, we don't strictly speaking need that finiteness here, but we're gonna do something for each theta individually. <laughs> and we're gonna only have finitely many theta technically. Well, not technically not, but we're gonna pretend we do. So we just take the sum out, use the triangle inequality very crudely. Now, what do I want to do here? I'm going to separate out the shat norm of V sub theta because that's independent of T and just end up with an integral of some scalar valued things. Like so. So if we just look at this term here, this integral of scalar valued functions, we have an L2 norm of some stuff. And because this is scalar valued, we have Plancherel's theorem. So we can say the L2 norm of this is the L2 norm of its Fourier transform. So we use Plancherel's theorem. We write out all the terms that were already there. And we have the integral over frequencies in R. So this is now gonna be d psi. Uh, this M of theta doesn't depend on T at all, so that doesn't change. And the Fourier multiplication by M becomes multiplication by M on the Fourier side. Uh, this exponential, this modulation becomes a translation on the Fourier side and we have a dilation, L2 normalized dilations get mapped to L2 normalized dilations with one on the dilation parameter on the Fourier side. We have phi hat of psi minus theta. If you haven't done any Fourier analysis, that's gonna to be too quick for you. So just trust me on this. This is what happens in when you take a Fourier transform. Dilations become dilations like that. This modulation becomes a translation. Yeah, cool. So let's just argue for each theta individually because we only have finitely many, or at least we're pretending that we do. If you take this thing on the inside here, integral and you just change variables so that you're looking at an integral of basically we want this dilation and this translation to disappear so you change variables to get rid of all of that you end up with m of theta minus m of psi on s plus theta you might want to check this computation i've just Pulled it out of nowhere. I checked it when I wrote the notes, but I could have been wrong. That squared phi hat of psi squared d psi. So you can shift all of the dilation and translation from phi hat onto the symbol M just by changing variables. Now M is bounded 
and continuous away from zero. Oops, I can't spell from. And theta is not zero. So what happens here is that as S, hang on, yep. As S goes to infinity, this term here goes to zero. You can apply the dominated convergence theorem and you see that this integral goes to zero using that continuity because m of psi on s plus theta goes to m of theta as s goes to infinity. And here's the m of theta, that becomes zero. So for each individual theta, as s goes to infinity, this error term goes to zero. If you only have finitely many terms in that sum, it means the sum will go to zero. If you have infinitely many terms, you have to work harder. So we really should have worked harder to reduce it down to the case of a finite sum. Let's pretend the sum is finite, as I keep saying, and the error term vanishes. <laughs> So as long as we are careful, this shows that the norm of this Schur multiplier is controlled by the Michelin norm of the symbol times the Shatton norm of V, which is what we needed to show. This is a really nice argument. It's um this whole reduction of Schur multipliers down to Fourier multipliers. So what, what the result truly says, it's a, it's a transference type result. It says if your symbol comes from a, the symbol of a bounded Fourier multiplier, then the associated Schur multiplier is also bounded on Schatten classes CP with P greater than one and less than infinity. And it does boil down to the fact that this Schatten class is UMD. So I think that's quite nice. Any questions about it? Okay. So from this, we're going to prove this potapov sukhachev theorem at the start, which seems to have nothing even to do with Schur multipliers, let alone UMD spaces. <laughs> so we have to somehow reduce that down to Schur multipliers of the right form, in fact, because firstly, we're going to reduce it down to Schur multipliers, but they're not going to have the right form. We need to do a further reduction to get the form that we can bound using the theorem we just proved. That's going to be the rest of the lecture. So we start with a lemma. Let's call this the pre potapov sukhachev lemma. Because actually all of the content, all of the main arguments in the proof of this theorem are actually in this lemma. Once we've got this lemma, the result actually follows. So let's take U to be compact and self-adjoint on a Hilbert space H and V to be a bounded operator on H. We don't need compactness or self-adjointness. These are not the same U and V that are going to appear in the conclusion. In that conclusion, U and V are compact self-adjoint operators. In this lemma, U is compact and self-adjoint. V is just bounded. Then for all Lipschitz functions, F from the real line to itself, we have a, a commutator estimate. So the commutator of F of U with V, commutator of A and B is AB minus BA, if you forgot. Commutator of these operators, I should also say for all P between one and infinity. The Schatten P norm of the commutator is bounded by the Lipschitz norm of F times the Schatten norm of the commutator of U and V. It doesn't look like it has much to do with the potapov sukhachev theorem other than the fact that F of U appears because of course no commutators appear in the, the potapov sukhachev statement. I think what we should do is we should prove the lemma after the break, but I can before the break show you how this lemma implies the potapov sukhachev theorem. Proof of Potapov Sukhachev using this lemma. At least this motivates why this lemma is used. Like, where do these commutators come in? But my notes are out of order now, so I have to find a spot where I prove that. I was going to do that last, but the timing didn't work out. Okay. 
So the trick is to make the right choice of U and V and the right choice of Hilbert space. So you define capital U to be this two by two matrix of operators, which involve U and V. So U and V are the operators on H that we want to deal with. This is on the direct sum of the Hilbert space with, with itself. And that is again a Hilbert space. That's gonna be the Hilbert space we work with. And V is this two by two matrix operators, identities on the off diagonal. Are people comfortable with matrices of operators on direct sums? If, if you know what a matrix is on C2, you know what this matrix of operators is on H plus H, okay. So U, because U and V, small U and small V are both compact and self-adjoint, capital U is compact and self-adjoint. Not hard to prove. And V is also, what do we need about V? V's, do we need V to be self-adjoint in the, this lemma? I think we do, but I didn't say so. V should be self-adjoint. This V is self-adjoint. The way you compute adjoints on these matrices of operators is just how you compute them on complex matrices, but with adjoints instead of conjugations. Yeah. So these, this capital U and capital V satisfy the assumptions of the lemma. So we apply the lemma to that. So the lemma says that if you take the commutator of F of capital U with V and measure that in the Shatten p norm on the direct sum H plus H, that's controlled by the Lipschitz norm of F times the Shatten norm of the commutator of U with V. So we have to compute the commutators. Luckily, that's easy enough to do. That's one line computation, right? Commutator of F of capital U with capital V is F of capital U. Now, the way the spectral theorem or the function of calculus works on diagonal matrices of operators is it acts on the diagonal. Like that, fine. V is this operator here. So this is FU times V minus V times F of capital U. You do all the matrix multiplications and what this turns out to be is F of U minus F of V on the top right. F of V minus F of U on the bottom left and zeros on the diagonal. So take a moment to just check that, make sure that's correct. U. Yep, okay. Nobody disagrees with that. I always have to double check when I do matrix multiplication. <laughs> I do it not very often. Anyway, so that's the commutator of F of U with V. And you can get the same thing of just the commutator of capital U with V setting F to be the identity. So this F doesn't appear. So what this lemma is telling us is that the Schatten norm of this operator on this direct sum is bounded by this one. Okay, which almost looks like what we needed to prove, except that we don't actually have the norm of F of U minus FV. We have this norm of this matrix generated somehow by F of U minus FV. So we need to compute that Schatten norm. Luckily we can do that. For all W in the Schatten class on H, not on H plus H. If you take this matrix, which is ultimately what we're dealing with for particular choices of W, take its Schatten norm to the peak power, you know that that's written in terms of the trace of some stuff made out of the operators. So let's just compute it directly. This is the trace of this, all of this stuff to the P on two. That's the, the Schatten norm in terms of the trace. So you write out what that is. You do this matrix multiplication and you get W star W, zero, zero, W star W. 
you get this nice diagonal matrix. Do we agree with this? I agree with this. All of the negatives cancel out when you take the adjoints properly. Now, when you take this P on two power of a diagonal matrix, you just take the P on two powers of the diagonal terms. And you have the trace of that. And what's the trace of a diagonal matrix? It's just the sum of the terms down the diagonal. And because we're taking matrix of operators, it's the sum of the traces of the terms on the diagonal. And both of those terms are the same. So you get two times the trace of W star W to the P on two. And this is just two times the Schatten norm of W to the P power. So actually looking at the start and the end here, it says that the Schatten norm of this weird two by two matrix is basically just the original Schatten norm with the constant out the front, two to the one on P. So what we had up here is exactly what we wanted to show. <laughs> f of u minus f of v and the Schatten norm is controlled by the Lipschitz norm of f times the Schatten norm of u minus v as we needed to show. And that was assuming the lemma, right? So we really just need to prove this lemma. I think, okay, I'm not really an expert in this field. I don't know the whole historical development of this theorem. I mean, this theorem was conjectured a long time ago and it's been proven and disproven in various classes, but I think this reduction to the commutator estimate is quite old and well known. I think Podokov and Sukhachev knew that and then they just had to prove the commutator estimate. The difficulty is in proving that, right? Yeah. So let's just go back to this lemma, which is important. Remind ourselves what we need to prove. We'll prove this after the break. We'll reduce it down somehow to sure multipliers of the appropriate form. So I guess, yeah, the connection with sure multipliers is very old and well known, but getting the right sure multiplier results, getting them in the right form is not easy to do. Particularly when you deal with um, possibly non bounded operators U, which is what happens in the full theorem. You don't actually need compact U, you just need this, this commutator say to be in the Schatten class, which can happen. <laughs> 